Welcome to my lecture on Eastern Orthodoxy. Christianity was born in the Middle East. Christianity began in the East, but by the fourth century, it became clear that the Western clergy leaders and Eastern clergy leaders understood and practiced Christianity differently. After the fall of the Roman Empire, the Byzantium Empire continued for another 1,000 years. Constantinople was easily the biggest city in Europe in the year 1000. Its population of 600,000 was 10 times larger than Rome. Given the distance between the East and West and the distinct approaches to Christianity, it was clear that any unification of the Eastern and Western churches was a long shot. On the topic of the Nicene Creed, Orthodox leaders had questioned the wisdom of Western church leaders accepting the Latin word philoque. The translation is, and from the sun. Western clergy leaders inserted from the sun after the affirmation of faith in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father. The following is an up-to-date version. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Historian Mark Knoll explains that this doctrine of the Holy Spirit proceeding from both the Father and the Son, referred to as double procession, as opposed from the Father only, single possession, was a major reason for the divide between the Eastern and Western churches. The Orthodox Church saw this addition as unacceptable. Father and Son are necessarily defined by their interrelationship, quote, but the name Spirit seems to derive its individual character from its own nature without association. For the Orthodox Church's double procession was a matter of high offense. The Orthodox and Western churches differed in other ways. Western clergymen were clean shaven, whereas Eastern clergymen grew beards. Western clergy adopted celibacy, whereas the Eastern clergy could marry. For the Eucharist, the West used unleavened bread, bread that is without yeast, and the East used leavened bread. In the East, the Eucharist was more removed from congregation space since there was a separation of the congregation and the altar. Interestingly, the uh, church leaders appeared to conclude that it was enough for worshipers to be present at the Eucharist without receiving bread and wine. The Eucharist for lay people might only occur once a year. The Orthodox Church championed faithfulness to tradition. Eastern liturgy was more elaborate than in the West. The Eastern Church was unique with its hymns of criticism directed at, at heretics. For example, one hymn, one Orthodox hymn, presents Arius as another Judas who fell into sin. The Eastern Church was particular with membership. If a Western Christian sought membership in the Orthodox Church, they had to be rebaptized. The Eastern Church had clear ties to political change. According to historian Dyer Maid McCullough, the churches were wedded to imperial politics and the politics of the empire's successor states. Their spirituality has moved in rhythm set by these chances of history. One notable difference between Byzantine and Western churches concerned icons. The Eastern Church embraced icons and images. In the early 8th century, John of Damascus, an ethnic Arab and brilliant monk, was an influential defender of icons. McCullough writes that John was famed in the centuries that followed the triumph of his defense of images, not merely as a theologian and preacher, but as a poet. It was as a poet that he treasured images of all sorts, verbal and visual. They illuminate and intensify our vision of God. Indeed, in relation to God, they are essential because of the ultimately unknowable quality of God." End of quote. The key was separating absolute worship and relative worship. 
There was worship as adoration, but this was only for God only. Okay, so this is in reference, this is uh, your absolute worship. Relative worship was the worship of God's creation. It was encouraged that Christians at home or church offered worship of an icon. Another clear-cut difference concerned monasteries. Monasticism began in the East, but there was a lack of new and creative monastic orders compared to the West. While monasticism remained prominent, there were no counterparts to the Franciscans or the Dominicans and others that rose in the West. The Eastern monks were also less likely to devote themselves to widespread preaching, as was the case with many Western monks. The focus of Eastern monasteries was the perfection of their members by prayer and ascetic practices. But both Western and Eastern monasticism encountered the problem of diminishing piety. Many monks chose monasticism for its supposedly easy livelihood. Too many lacked the piety of earlier, monastics, uh, earlier monks and were ignorant uh, or uncaring of their religious responsibilities. Over the centuries, the relationship between Western and Eastern churches grew colder. One example was the rift between Pope Nicholas and the Patriarch Photius. This, that is the Patriarch, Patriarch of Constantinople. The Patriarchs of Constantinople began to question the doctrinal soundness of the popes. In the mid 11th century, Pope Leo IX and his right-hand man, Cardinal Humbert, were blunt about their power over all leaders. Leo sent Humbert to Constantinople to improve relations between the Pope and the Patriarch Celarius. But the encounter was a bitter one. Both excommunicated the other. This took place in 1054 and was the beginning of the Great Schism. The Catholic and Orthodox churches disengaged from each other. The Orthodox churches became quite isolated from Western influences. Eastern churches continued to reject the claims of papal supremacy. In the 1100s, the Bishop Nicetas of Nicomedia wrote, we do, not, we do not deny to the Roman church the primacy among the five sister patriarchates, patriarchates, but she has separated herself from us by her own deeds when through pride she assumed a monarch monarchy which does not belong to her office. How shall we accept decrees from her that have been issued without consulting us and even without our knowledge? If the Roman pontiff seated on the lofty throne of his glory wishes to thunder at us, and if he wishes to judge us and even to rule us and our churches, not by taking counsel with us, but at his own arbitrary pleasure, uh, pleasure, what kind of brotherhood or even what kind of parenthood can this be? We should not be slaves, not the sons of such a church, and the Roman see would not be the pious mother of sons, but a hard and furious mistress of slaves. A very important uh, statement from, from this bishop. The bitterness between the Western and Orthodox churches increased when crusaders sacked Constantinople. The son of a disposed emperor had promised the crusaders a large payment in return for their assistance in him regaining the imperial throne. When the promise of the payment was not kept, the crusaders plundered the city and Western Christian leaders controlled the city for almost six decades. Most crusaders viewed the Eastern Christians as heretics. Historian Judas Heron surveys the events of the Byzantine Empire. After Byzantine leaders reclaimed Constantinople in 1261, an important step was to improve its security against nearby Muslim forces. Byzantine emperors had no choice but to consider the union of Eastern and Western churches. Western leaders demanded unification before any Western assistance was forthcoming. But this meant that Constantinople would have to be subordinate to Rome. 
given what that given that the what the crusaders had done in 1204 this was not a popular idea with the people there was no enthusiasm for an ecclesiastical policy of compromise and agreement orthodox christians did not want any change to their church icons and ideas of our orthodoxy the orthodox also viewed the crusaders occupation of their churches and monasteries as outrageous after 1261, Emperor Michael VIII attempted to establish better relations with the West. In 1272, Gregory X became the Pope in 1272, and he planned a new crusade against the Muslims. Now, one important step was to call a general council of the church with the goal of ecclesiastical reforms and the reuniting of the Western and Eastern churches. Michael saw this as promising, and he began the process of having Eastern clergy leaders attend the council, but this would not be easy. The patriarch Joseph I and many bishops and monks opposed the idea. As they saw it, unity would concede the, concede the primacy of St. Peter over all churches and the Latin wording of the creed. Michael took the drastic action of imprisoning Patriarch Joseph. The emperor chose John Beckos to lead the campaign to convince the Orthodox clergy that unification was the best path to take. When the council met in Lyon in 1274, the Orthodox representation was weak. The Eastern representatives had a difficult journey, and the gifts of icons and church, church items set aside for the Pope were lost at sea. At the council, one relatively new aspect of Western theology debated was purgatory, something not accepted by Eastern clergy. The council adopted compromising language and did not mention purgatory in its final statement. After the leading Eastern delegates swore an oath of loyalty to the people and the Roman creed, Pope Gregory welcomed the return of the Orthodox Church to the fold. The Western Church leaders incorrectly assumed that the delegates had spoken for the entire Orthodox Church. In fact, one delegate, sta delegate stated his opposition. Instead of a conflict of words, instead of refutative proof, instead of arguments drawn from the scriptures, what we envoys consciously hear is, you have become a Frank. Should we who are pro-unionists be called supporters of a foreign nation and not Byzantine patriots? As it turns out, the so-called union failed to promise the promised military assistance for Byzantium. When Michael, when Emperor Michael died, so did the unpopular policy of enforcing church leaders to adhere to the Lyon Council. The patriarch, patriarchs that came after the death of Michael rejected the union of Western and Eastern churches. The Orthodox Christians continue to voice their opposition to Western interpretations and practices. For example, one anonymous tract asked, why do you priests not marry? The church does not forbid the priest to take a wife, but you do not marry. Instead, you have concubines and your priest send his servant to him to bring him his concubine and puts out the candle and keeps her for the whole night. So this was uh, obviously quite scandalous. Reunification had failed, but there were signs that the idea was not completely dead. The historian Judith Heron explains that the hope that Western Christian forces with papal blessing would eventually come to the aid of the Byzantines was kept alive by the growing interest in Latin theology and the first translations of Latin fathers by Greek scholars. The translating of Augustine and other classical Latin literature to Greek gave Eastern clergy a better understanding of the West. Some leading Orthodox intellectuals converted to Roman Catholicism. 
in the 1360s, Emperor John V, who submitted to Roman authority, pushed for Western military cooperation against the Muslims. His pro-Western policy ended when a Muslim force defeated Christians at Mer Merita in 1371. By 1422, Muslim forces conquered land near Constantinople. Emperor John VIII attempted to reunite the churches, hoping to receive military support from the West. The Patriarch Joseph II and other church chief clergy leaders traveled to see the Pope, but the meeting between the Patriarch and the Pope almost never happened when Joseph learned that he was expected to kiss the Pope's foot like the other officials. He met with Pope Eugenius IV, but it was a private reception and not a grand public ceremony. Pressured by John, the Eastern delegates agreed to statements that began the process of reunification. In 1439, a final document stated the formal unification of the two churches. But unification was short lived. In 1452, Pope Nicholas V sent Isidore of Kiev, a Roman Catholic convert, to Constantinople to promote the Union. His work was difficult due to persisting opposition. Persisting opposition. One Byzantine monk wrote, wretched Romans, how you have been deceived. Together with the city which will soon be destroyed, you have lost your piety. And as, as what followed uh, the next year, 1453, the city did fall to the Muslims. So we have the fall of Constantinople in 1453. Beyond the reach of Muslims were developments in Russia. Before the Great Schism, the Prince of Moravia asked the Byzantine Emperor Michael III to send missionaries to, Mora to the Moravians. Two brothers answered the call. Miss missionary Cyril and Methodius understood the Slavic language, and they took the unwritten language and prepared an alphabet for converts to have the scriptures and literature in the Slavic language. Known as Glagolitic, this language was the forerunner of today's Cyrillic, named after Cyril. This allowed impressive advances of Orthodox Christianity. Cyril and Methodius have received the title of the Apostles of the Slavs. Another example of religious activity concerns the Bulgarians. Bulgarians in the ninth century adopted Christianity. Under the leadership of Boris I, who reigned from 852 to 889, the Bulgarian people earned the right to have an independent church organization under the ecumenical patriarch. The Bulgarians also received permission to conduct their liturgy in the Slavonic language. Likewise, Serbia adopted the old church Slavonic language and Orthodox Christianity. There was also successful missionary work in Russia. Pagan Russia favored animism, the, plural, the plurality of gods, and significant reference for material objects. Princess Olga accepted Christianity in 955, and she guided her grandson, Vladimir, to be a Christian in 988. There was also the influence of politics. Vladimir's marriage to the sister of the Byzantine emperor was only possible by his conversion to Christianity. One leg legend is that Vladimir decided it was important to adopt a major religion in the best interest of his subjects. His, he sent an envoys to research Islam, Judaism, Latin, and Byzantine Christianity. As the story goes, he was won over by Byzantine, Byzantine Christianity when envoys sent 
to Constantinople declared that when they attended the church services at the great church of Hagia Sophia, they, quote, could not tell whether they were on earth or in heaven. In addition to all this going on, we have various uh, missionaries that are doing good, good work. So uh, Russia was um, becoming a, a Christian, um, adopting Christianity in its culture. The, this event uh, signaled the triumphs of Eastern Christianity in Russia. Vladimir encouraged the baptism of his subjects, and he approved the transfer of icons, priests, and liturgical vessels from Byzantium. Icons included portraits of saints and people of the Bible. They were a very important component of worship, as they had been for other Orthodox Christians. For the Russians, the forms of worship have even been more important than theology or ethics. The appeal of orthodoxy was aesthetic, not intellectual. Historian Mark Knoll writes that icons were a reminder of the materiality of Christ's incarnation. The Slavonic writings of Cyril and Methodius were brought to Russia, and the Russian people, Russian people benefit by having liturgy and writings in plain, intelligible language. When Vladimir died, his son Savyatopak seized power and had three of his Christian brothers killed. And it's interesting that uh, two of his Christian brothers, so the story goes, actually didn't, did not resist. And they became the saints of the Russian Orthodox Church. Vladimir's other son, Yaroslav, the wise, well, Yaroslav defeated his brother and increased the importance of the church. As a result of the vision of the Western and Eastern Church in 1054, the Russians learned to view the Catholics as heretics. Like Eastern Orthodoxy in general, Russian Orthodoxy also saw the close connection of church and state. Monasticism also made its mark in Russia. Notable was the monastery of the caves at Kiev. Under the direction of Theodosius, the monastery did wonderful work for the poor, certainly modeled a clear direction on the issue of poverty. If he found extra food or garments in the cells of his monks, he gathered them and threw them into the fire. He was believed to have said, it is wrong for us who are monks and have renounced the world to collect property in our cells. How can a monk offer God a pure prayer if he has hidden possessions? One of the better known Russian Christians was Sergius of Randones. He became a leader of a monastic community in a forest 40 kilometers north of Moscow. He encouraged a monastic tradition where Roman spirituality began to reach the common masses. The Russian state, from its origins at Kiev, through centuries of Mongol domination, grew slowly. The pace of expansion increased dramatically with the rule of Ivan III, also known as Ivan the Great, in the late 1400s. Newly acquired land was quickly populated by Cossacks, Russian peasants that Ivan had encouraged to move into new territories. The Cossacks spread eastward across the Volga and into Siberia. Ivan III was also dedicated to creating a powerful centralized state. Not surprisingly, his chief inspiration was Byzantium. Ivan married the niece of the last Byzantine emperor and took the title Tsar, a, a term derived from, the, from Caesar. As with his Byzantine predecessors, Ivan enjoyed tremendous political and religious authority. Russia came to be considered, uh, sorry, Russians came to consider Moscow as the third Rome. 
the first two, of course, Rome and Constant Constantinople, both which had been conquered. Okay, to, to conclude, the Russian Orthodox Church remained in the orbit of Byzantine, and until the mid-1400s, it was a subservient part of the greater Byzantine Church. In the bigger picture, what unfolded in Russia was another example of the divide between Orthodox and Western Christianity. The understanding and practice of Christianity continued to widen as Western and Orthodox churches took separate paths. Thank you.